ABCs of NMOSD is an education podcast series to share knowledge about neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMOSD, a rare, relapsing autoimmune disorder that preferentially causes inflammation in the optic nerves and spinal cord. ABCs of NMOSD is hosted by SRNA, the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association, and in collaboration with the Sumaira Foundation and Guthy Jackson Charitable Foundation. SRNA is a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders. You can learn more about us on our website at weareSRNA.org. This series is sponsored in part by Amgen, Alexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease, and UCB. This is a podcast about men's experience with NMO State. We're here on ABC's NMO State. I would just like to talk to you about your experiences as someone that has, you know, NMO and is male. You guys are in the minority group, so I'd love to hear just just a little bit of your story. Can you guys each begin by briefly introducing yourselves? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, my name is Doug Kirby. I live in Harriman, Utah, which is a little bedroom community just uh, southwest of Salt Lake. I'm married uh, for a little over 40 years now to my wife, Holly, and we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary here a couple of months ago. We have five kids and eight grandchildren, and, and several of them are here visiting. So if you hear some small voices in the background, that's what you're hearing is, is, is the grandkids. I was diagnosed with NMO seven and a half years ago. And yeah, so I, I still work. I'm, I'm partially paralyzed and I can walk a little bit. And, but uh, for long trips, I take, a, I take a wheelchair that's powered that I can get around in. But I work from home, which is, is awesome to be able to do that. So I get a little bit more time to, to sleep in in the morning and, and whatnot. So we can talk some more about that in a minute. How about you, Andrew? Like, what was, who are you? What's your, what's your introduction? Yeah. So my name is Andrew and I'm originally from Northern California, but I currently live in Baltimore, Maryland, where I'm a graduate student studying health policy and public health at Johns Hopkins University. And I was diagnosed with NMOSD in May of 2022, um, following my first and only attack. And it was around the same time that I was also diagnosed with other autoimmune uh, conditions, including lupus and Graves' disease. Yeah. And just in case the viewer is curious, I also have NMO. I've had it since I was six, so I've had it for like 16 years. <laughs> I've been in it for a bit. But again, I, I'm, I'm just so pleased to be able to be here and talk to two people that are like me and two people that uh, I feel their stories can really connect to our community. Um, now, if, if it's okay, can we talk uh, about the diagnosis? Like, what was your diagnosis story? How did it first start out? Whoever wants to take the question first. Andrew, why don't you go first? Great. Well, you know, I don't know that I've always had thought as much about how all of this sort of happened because it happened so quickly. I think I fell very ill in early May of 2022, and I was actually admitted to the hospital with a neutropenic fever initially. And, you know, my, fe my fever would stabilize and then it would come back. And this happened for four to five days. And my doctors really weren't sure what was going on with me. Um, initially, they thought I had some infectious disease. And, you know, after about, again, four to five days at the hospital, um, I started vomiting. And then I had a lot of the other symptoms that, you know, we associate with NMO and they all just began to snowball. I experienced bladder retention, lower extremity weakness, paralysis, double vision, and I had, you know, persistent hiccups. And so I'd already been admitted. So I was already in the hospital when a lot of these symptoms really manifested in a pretty severe way. And so I actually got, I was diagnosed 
fairly quickly, really within a matter of days, also just because of the hospital where I was at. And, you know, I took some blood work and, you know, we realized weeks later, once it came back that I was seronegative for both the aquaporin-4 and MOG antibodies. But my clinical presentation was just so in line with NMOSD. I was diagnosed ultimately <laughs> after that episode with double seronegative NMOSD in the setting of lupus. And I had already been diagnosed with Graves' disease about a month before my initial hospitalization. So it was really rapid. And I went to inpatient rehab and really relearned how to walk um, and was in physical therapy for a few months. Um, but I've regained most of my um, functional status. And, you know, I try to stay active. Um, I like to swim and run occasionally and play pickleball. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be able to regain a lot of my functional status. Um, so. Yeah, that's wonderful. It, it does take a lot. It takes a lot to bounce back from all that. Um, how about you, Doug? I, what about your story? I've I've heard it before. It's a it's a beautiful so, story. Yeah, I'll try and do the. I'll give you the short version. So yeah, in 2016, um, I started having um, symptoms. Some of the ones that uh, that Andrew mentioned. I started having nausea and vomiting and and uh, intractable hiccups. That's a new word I learned. Intractable. And I uh, went to the ER three times with two or more of those symptoms. And they treated the symptoms, but they, they didn't know what to do with me. And, and no one had any idea what was going on. Uh, sent me home, sent me to specialists, other folks to take a look. The one thing that uh, I think is different about men that I've heard about women is they believed me. And sometimes women, I, I've heard from other women in the in, 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 that have this disease that they're not always treated as well, honestly, as men are. I don't know why that's the case, and it's unfortunate. But I was believed, and, and so I appreciated that. Just around Christmas time, I started feeling tingling in my hands and feet and other places. And one day at work, I pulled a bottle of, of chocolate milk out of the refrigerator, and it was warm. So I put it in the other hand and put it back, and it was cold. You know, so I was having problems sensing temperature as well. I went and saw my primary care physician who started me on a therapy and then referred me to a neurologist. It took me about three weeks to get into the neurologist. And, and when I finally got there, we had a good visit. And I, other than the tingling and some of the other symptoms, I was in pretty good shape. I have a brother and sister that both have MS. And I assumed this was probably just my turn. About a week later after that visit, during the visit, she was going to have a MRI and a the poke in the back, what do we call that? <laughs> Spinal tap. Yeah, that one of those. And she says she was going to schedule those. And, and about a week after that, was, I guess it was on a Monday, I started to feel weak. And by Saturday, I couldn't walk. And by Sunday, I was bedridden, essentially. I had some people come over and help me get out of bed. And, and the MRI and, and the lumbar puncture happened on the next Tuesday, I had to have help getting into the car and out of the car. And I was, I was pretty paralyzed. I didn't know where anything on my left side of my body was. And, uh, while we were going through that process, what, one of the bigger hospitals called my wife and said, we have a room for your husband on our neural floor. I got there and, and the neurologist that was there sat me down on the bed and said, well, you'll be here for a few weeks while we get you better. And then you'll have several weeks of inpatient therapy and, and then outpatient therapy and so forth and so on. And, and I assumed I had MS. And so I thought she was talking crazy to me. And as soon as they would start the high dose of steroids, the feelings would start to come back and I would be fine because that's what my brother went through with MS. That didn't happen um, with me. The steroids didn't help at all. And it wasn't until they did Plex or apheresis where they essentially replaced the plasma in your blood that I started to get some feeling and sensation back. I was in the neural floor and it's a little more complicated than this, but for about four weeks getting better. And I went through the, the plasma five times twice. 
So I had to do that two times. And then I was six weeks in inpatient therapy. When I got home, I could, I could walk if somebody was holding me, but I still didn't know where my left foot was. And it took about two, three months to find my feet. This arm, is, especially the fingers, are still kind of a mystery to me. I don't know where they're always at. This hand works like that claw thing at the, you know, that you walk into a big superstore and there's that thing where if, you, if you're lucky, you can grab a, a plush toy and pull it back out. That's how this hand works. I think that's the best way to describe that. So um, I had a lot of the same symptoms, Andrew, that you had. But uh, nobody knew what to do with me. I wasn't in the hospital, and and it, it it took a long time. And I think because it took a long time for me to get diagnosed, uh, I'm still I still have several deficits that, that don't let me do the things that I would like to do. I know that can be frustrating. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. we, you know, we all all have those, so I'm I I don't right. We I don't, all get I don't complain it. about them, but yeah. I mean, you have every right to complain about them, but people look to you as a as a real a real pillar of our community. So we appreciate it. Well, that's very kind. I uh, I, I was reading in social media yesterday or the day before, through you know a bunch of people in our community. And one person, you know, made a comment. I can't wait for them to find a cure so that I could have my old life back. And I thought, you know what? I didn't respond because I wasn't quite sure how to say this, but your old life's gone. And if you're going to find happiness and, and joy in what you're doing, you got to understand your new life and you have to find it there. So and that's not true just for people in our community. I think people all around the, the globe have experiences like that where, where they think they're going or where they think they're going to get somebody puts a, a, a roadblock in the way and you got to take a new path. So anyway, I, I firmly that. agree with that. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's a better philosophy to have. It's something that it takes time to really grasp. I know for me, I, I always told myself, "Oh, I'll I'll go do all those things once I'm better." But then I started yeah. putting my whole life on hold. So yeah. I, I definitely I definitely understand where you're coming from. But leading into this, what are your what were your emotions like going through the beginning of your disease, that the disease journey up until like now? How how are you feeling then, and how are you feeling now? That question goes both to both you, I mean, whoever wants to answer first. Right, yeah. During the initial hospitalization, I think really so different than my experience with, than my experience was so different than Doug's in that mm -hmm. the diagnosis and happened so quickly and I was given treatment so immediately. I mean, I remember that time period, those like few weeks uh, when I was in the hospital, I think initially I, I, I felt a lot of disbelief and denial that my body was actually falling apart. You know, Doug, it's so interesting to me to hear that you, you had siblings who had MS. And so in some ways you, you had some sort of anchor to kind of try to imagine maybe what was going on with your body. Yeah. And I, I felt like my body was in so much shock and I really was so delayed in being able to process everything that was going on with me. I mean, you know, I remember feeling like in similar ways to you, like I was just going to wake up the next day and be totally fine, even though, you know, I couldn't even get out of bed by myself. And, you know, I had a fully catheter in me, right? Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, just to really illustrate where I was emotionally, uh, my brother, my older brother was getting married a couple weeks after I was actually hospitalized. And so I kept, you know, here I was, my, the symptoms were getting worse. And I kept asking nurses and doctors, Hey, do you think I'm gonna be able to get on that flight next week? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's where I was, mm -hmm. even though I couldn't even, you know, get out of bed. Yeah. Right. But I was trying to figure out, Oh, should I just move my flight back so I can attend my brother's wedding? And everyone said, we'll see, we'll see. But you know, and I think that just really illustrates the state of denial, right, that you're in and not really understanding the circumstances of like what it actually, what was going on with me. And I, you know, I feel like that it wasn't really, you know, when I realized I wasn't going to make that wedding, I think that was, I think the first time I started really getting a sense of like grief or that loss that you go through, you know, it was the first time I had experienced what had changed, right, Doug, like what you just said, like everything, things are not going to be the same anymore. Sure. And, yeah. You know, really settling in what this diagnosis means, 
and I think initially planted the seed, which is where I hung out in for a long time, was that I just wouldn't be able to do anything, any of the things that I wanted to do or that I'd done before. And I think I my I was in that headspace for so long that I'm just everything is I was like everything is different. I'm never going to be the same again. But really took a really cynical or a grieving perspective. And I held on to that for a long time, I would yeah. say. I wish that I had moved through that more quickly. And that it and it actually came back six months later when I had a follow-up MRI. I gained all my functional abilities again, but getting that MRI being back in that environment back in the hospital just really set me um uh, into really sort of spiraling for a while. And so I, I would say that, you know, my initial emotions were disbelief and denial, and then went into just deep sadness and anger that how could this happen? And I think now I'm really probably the last year, maybe the last six months have really been, you know, two years since where I've really been able to move a little bit more toward acceptance or seeing this in being able to find glimpses of how to live with this disease yeah, yeah. again. So it took yeah. a lot longer than I would have wanted. But I, You know, I'm, I'm far enough down this road. I'm going to kind of maybe start by talking about grief and, and you know what, you have to grieve. You have to go through a process um, um, of just like you would if you'd lost, you know, your favorite pet or, or, or a friend or something like that. And, and for me, I think that process was a little different, but I think it was a good year before I was kind of moving more forward, but you have to go through it. You do. Yeah. Um, and and the people that don't want to or deny that or just it, it, it's, you're going to get stuck. And so you have to get used to that. So I, I used a couple of different approaches and, and uh, Andrew, you, you kind of set this up. So I'm going to go down this road and, and part of this um, uh, conversation, Ireland is, you know, how is this for men? How is this different? Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the things that uh, I learned very early on is I had to turn in my man card. <laughs> right. I, I, I had to just say there's stuff that I can't do on my own. Now I was fortunate that my wife was with me pretty much 24 seven. And so I was able to have her help me take a shower and do some of those other things. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you two experiences. And one is, you know, I had just gone to the bathroom and, and there was my wife there. And then an aide was there helping me to, to do what you need to do after you've been to the bathroom. And, and uh, I turned to the aide and I apologized to her and said, I'm sorry that you have to do this. And, and she was so kind. And she said, you know, this is what I do. This is, this is what I'm here for. And she made me feel so comfortable. Uh, in spite of the fact that I was not in a very comfortable space. And then maybe a second experience. Well, let me back that up with two two thoughts real quickly. First of all, in Ireland, you've heard this story, I think, but but I'm gonna give just let I'm not gonna share the whole thing other than to say when I was a teenager, I had an experience that led me to believe that later in life I would have some difficulties health-wise. And so when this came to me, this was, even though it took a while to get diagnosed, it was not a shock. It was something that I was expecting. And so I handled this a little differently. And, and one of the things that I tried to do was to make sure that everybody that came in to help me was having a good day because I was doing the best I can. And when I was in inpatient therapy, the catheter had gone out, right? I didn't have that anymore, but I still couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. Mm -hmm. And 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 if you've been there, and if you know what that means, that means a nurse is going to come in with a straight cath, a catheter, and insert that thing and and drain you, and and, and then make sure you're empty. And they come in every four hours and with a ultrasound to see how full you are, and 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 on that particular floor, their aides were allowed to do that once they were trained. And I remember this brand new aid and she, and she said, can I, can I, can I do this? And, and, you know, you think about this experience, right? You've got the regular nurse there and, and this aide who's in her early twenties and, and she's so excited. And so I, I said, yes, because that was my goal is to make her day happy. And 
and she did, and she did a great job. And 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 a couple of weeks later, she saw me in the hallway and she screamed, "You're the one that let me do that thing!" And she described it. Or I don't remember what she said, but but you know, you, you you just have to. I can say I don't know what the right metaphor is, but I turned in my man card. I had to get help from people, and I had to appreciate that help. You know, some people reject that, and they see that as you know, not doing the best they can, or they're embarrassed. There's a lot of reasons that that you could be that way, but but you just have to let it go. And 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 Andrew and I are in a in a in a, a rare group of a rare group, right? And mm-hmm. even though you're you're zero zero negative, you know, based on some of your symptoms, I suspect that you have the same disease that I have. I'm aquaporin four, and and you know, first of all, it's a rare disease, and Andrew, for every one or two of us, there's eight to 16 women, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So men having this disease is exceptional. And there are an exceptional group of men that have this. We, I, I, Andrew, you're one of them. We haven't met, but I just get that sense from what you said already. And in our, uh, our conference that we had a couple of weeks ago in LA, there were 10 men amongst the mm-hmm. other 85 women or whatever were there. So you know, it, it's different for men and we have a good men's group and we talk about things and we're open about things. And, and we've gone, I've gone through that grieving period. And now I just, I, I look at things that I wish I could do and I don't feel terribly bad about that. Maybe that's the medication. I don't know, <laughs> but you, you get beyond that at some point. I so like, I, I'm rambling again. <laughs> no, I can, I, I just wanted to respond a little bit. To what do Doug it was saying. I mean, I think this man card that you're talking about, Doug, so resonant with me in the ways that, you know, even just growing up, you know, obviously in sports, it's like, you know, people will often be like, man up, you know, yeah, exactly. defense, be tough. Um, yeah. And I think that was definitely a lot of the ways that was definitely the environment that I was raised in. And I think what I realize, so I, you know, I'm not married, you know, I'm in my mid thirties, you know, still in school trying to figure out what I'm going to be. And when I, you know, fell, when I got sick, when I was hospitalized, you know, my, my family lives on the whole other side of the country and they were not able to be there, even though, right. I'm unmarried. You know, my mom is still my emergency contact right? <laughs> or like, you know, uh, you know and but, you know, my family wasn't able to fly out and be with me during that time. Obviously, my brother was getting married, but my younger brother's disabled and my mom's been a full-time caregiver for him. And so I think even growing up in that sort of an environment, I knew, given just how much care that my parents provide to my younger brother on a regular basis, that I needed to be independent. You know, like I needed to take care of things and be on my own. And now I was sort of, I, now I was for sure put in a situation where I had to rely on others. And I think especially as, you know, as you go into adulthood, there's this idea that we um, should become less dependent on others, right? Financially, emotionally, and to be stronger. And I you know, during my entire hospitalization, I had to rely on my friends and my cohort of other PhD students who were here in Baltimore to really advocate for me when I wasn't in a position to advocate for myself. I, even though we studied health services research and policy, when you're interacting with the healthcare system for the first time, I've been pretty healthy for most of my life. And so learning how to talk and and understand what's going on even when it's really complicated and there's so many different you know doctors coming in and out of the room i think you know hearing you talk about turning in the man card i think what really came for me was just not so much the man card like that i lost it in some way i think it was just sort of forced to be in a position to reframe that for myself and reframe that identity that was already pretty broken (laughs) already this idea that we must as we get older we must rely less on others 
and I, yeah, I think for, you know, those in the NMOSD community, I've, I've personally have never felt treated differently because we are rare. I mean, people keep saying, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that and I, I don't, I haven't been as much, maybe that's more apparent when you're in these uh, more patient advocacy spaces and you look around the room, but I think the other thought that came to mind too, and I, I wanted to, I thought about this beforehand is because men are expected to be strong and mature, especially by a certain age. I think one thing that I've learned is that to not rush to finding meaning, I think we are often resilience um, and 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 that's a way of reclaiming this like strength again or power that uh, many of us want to have but i think when when you're diagnosed with these sort of conditions you do have to give up a little you have to give up power to this because there's so much unknown that we live with on a regular right. day regular basis that's right you know you you, you, you you triggered a thought and that's that as we you know, we're diagnosed with the disease and we're left with some degree of disability. If you dwell on the question of why do I have this disease or why did this happen to me? And, you know, whether you're, you're faith-based or however, whatever, you know, if you dwell on that question, you're going to get stuck. The way that I like to look at this is I'm in a new space. What is there for me to learn in this space? What can I learn while I'm here? And um, I've learned a ton. Uh, I've learned so much about, you know, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm from a small community here in Utah. And quite frankly, my, my breadth of friends is not, was not very wide. And, and I have got to know so many people that I would never have met had I not had this disease. Um, I've been able to identify some of my uh, biases that I've been able to correct because I have met real people instead of caricatures of people that I had in my mind. And that would have never happened. And so the fact that I have this disease is an opportunity for me to learn things, to grow in ways that there's just no other way to happen, to do. You know, I've, I've learned that, you know, probably 70% of the people that we meet, even though they won't say anything, are going through something equally as difficult as what you and I go through. And we should treat them accordingly we should be nice we should care for one another so you know i'm i'm a different person i talked about this a few weeks ago in a work meeting and a couple of the people that said flatly that one that i've worked with for probably 15 years now and he said you're a different person than you were seven years ago and if i hadn't had this opportunity <laughs> it's a bad way to say that i suppose but if I hadn't gone through this experience, I'd be the same person I was seven years ago. And that wouldn't be the right thing. I would not have grown. And, and again, I, you know, I don't wish diseases upon anybody. I don't wish them upon myself. But, but if we take what we're dealing with as an opportunity to figure out who we are and what we can become, even in this awkward, weird state, good things can happen. So, and by the way, you know, I, I did get my man card back mostly. <laughs> okay, every once in a while I have to turn it in. Uh, but, but, you know, I'll just be honest with you. There were uh, at least two times that I can think about when I was alone uh, in the hospital having a bad experience that, that I, I cried. I, I, I teared up and, and uh, you know, asked for some help and, and, and got that and got some comfort. So, you know, we men are, you know, we like to think we're macho, and, and we are, but we don't have to be, and we don't have to be always. And it, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a difficult, well, let me say that differently. It's an opportunity to learn about who you can be and what you can be. So I'm sorry, I'm rambling. I keep doing that, but. You know, this is a. No, it's wonderful. I, 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 and I, I hope I don't sound too Pollyannish, but, but I'm pretty happy, and and I have a good life. I can't do a lot of the things that I used to do. I, I used to love to go out and weed, and the temperature, the heat limits that to about an hour. 
I, you know, sometimes when I'm out weeding, I find myself on the ground and I can't get back up. We had to call the neighbors once to come help me get up off the ground. You know, so you have to kind of, you know, not be embarrassed at those things. So anyway. No, I think it's fair. I think that if you don't try and find the positive, even in the darkness, it just, it kills you. It kills your light. You have to cope somehow. It's a, nobody can ever look down upon you for that. I think that you, you think are an amazing I, person. I, I, and I think it's important to, to recognize that there will be times right? Even seven years later, there's, there are days, there are dark days, you know, and, and, and we get through those, but, but I try to limit those and try not to have too many. And sometimes those happen when, you know, I, I get real comfortable just sitting and I don't feel any buzzing. I don't feel anything. And then I stand up and then I remember, oh yeah, I have an MO, <laughs> you know, and I have to deal with that. But they, they, they go away quickly now. I don't really have very many bad days, but I want to be careful that you know, people don't think that that life is a one hundred percent wonderful all of the time, because yeah. there are going to be people understand. Things. People yeah. understand that that's how you get through it. I think it's a it's a fair way of getting through it. Like we all are, we're we're journeying together through this. Right. So I, I did hear. I mean, Andrew, you said you might not feel it as much, but so you know, NMO it tends to affect more women than men. Do you feel really isolated ever being like the minority of the minority, or or do you still have the connections? You know, I think one of the benefits, I think, or I was really fortunate that when I was in the hospital and still recovering, and then my providers were already looped into all of the amazing organizations that support patients with NMOSD that exist out there, whether that's obviously SRNA, uh, the Guthy Jackson Foundation, and the Samara Foundation. And, mm -hmm. you know, my provider wrote these, you know, organizations on the whiteboard in my hospital. Oh, that's awesome. So I knew that they existed. So I knew that there were, I, I wasn't in a position to start reaching out, but I felt like I reached out really early on. And in my recovery. So as soon as I was out of inpatient rehab and, you know, still doing outpatient physical therapy, I, I decided to reach out. And I actually think that I found the, you know, the men's NMO group really quickly. You know, I like, I actually met Doug probably the, probably the last time we've ever chatted. I, we've seen each other at different oh. events online. And I, I've come across your name and different videos, Doug. But I, I think I I mess like I I met I, I attended that support group within a couple months after I had been diagnosed and was still recovering. And so I found, you know, I think in that way, Ireland, that's where it, it was hard for me to realize like how few of us there are because I found so many and I saw that the conversation was like vibrant and the people had been done this before. And, you know, at that first meeting, I remember that it was, I think, Doug and probably, you know, Craig Klein, who, you know, the first thing that yeah. they said to me, because I showed up really freaking out, I was expecting to relapse. I was sort of in that waiting period where I just waiting for, you know, my treatment to fail and waiting to be back in the hospital. You know, I thought this is gonna, going to be the rhythm of my life. And I remember, I think it was, you know, Doug, Craig, and whoever of the other guys that were in that group, you know, they stopped and they said, you are not going, this is not going to happen. You will live a life again. You will live a life that you want to live again, and you will find new things on how to live that life. And so I think, you know, I, I feel like I've been in a fortunate position to have that level of support so quickly and early and Part of that was I was motivated to seek that out. Part of it was that my providers knew that it existed and told me to look, go for it. And shortly after, I attended another support group for younger folks who are in 20s and 30s with SRNA. And um, I think through that, I've just been able to feel less alone. I'm realizing how rare we are and unique, I guess, we are, Doug. Um, yeah, absolutely. But I think I've never felt alone in this 
a disease process or just just in coming to terms with this condition um, because of the group of people who are actively reaching out to each other. Yeah, I agree with that. It took me a little longer to find uh, the groups. And our first Guthy Jackson that we went to, we got in late and had to leave early. And so we really didn't connect with anybody, but it was helpful to know that that there were others out there. You know, uh, a lot of people are hesitant to join a support group, I think, because, you know, it feels it, it's like therapy or whatever. I, it, it, again, it, it shows a weakness of some kind. But, but uh, you know, the support group and the men's support group in particular, because someone I'm mostly familiar with and is um, it's just about a bunch of people that have something in common and, and you know, boosting each other up and, and, and you know, how is it going and how did your last, you know, treatment go? And, and, and it's just a place to, to chat. And, and it's, it's a really good experience. And my wife and I also do a, a general support group with SRNA and um, I love it because um, I can be having a bad day. And when I get together with my friends, um, men or women that have this disease, they lift me. And uh, that's always so helpful. So yeah, there's a lot to be said for SRNA and for Kathy Jackson and the other foundations. Um, it's a strong community. It really is once you figure it out and get into it, it's because it can be very lonely. It can be a lonely disease. It can be. Um, jumping off from that, I, I think that's, you both have very different experiences because one of you has been like a part of a family. One of you might want to start a family someday. I, I do want to ask. So as men, you have certain so, social expectations about being the head of your household and, you know, the provider of the household, the breadwinner, you know, do, do you think that having a rare neuroimmune disorder and having that expectation levied on you comes into conflict? How, how do you feel about that? How does that like, how do you manage that? As someone who's in that state right now, who already has a family, who already has a wife to care for, and someone who might want to have those things someday. Uh, yeah, I, Andrew, what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I, I definitely struggled initially right after being diagnosed with feeling desirable. Desirable, whether that's in a romantic partnership, or even in a career, I think I was really wondering, and I still actually wonder that, you know, I'm still in school, I'm hoping to finish. And I still ask those questions of myself, like what, what does work look like to me going forward, just given ongoing symptoms like fatigue? I think in terms of being kind of the breadwinner of a household, that's still ingrained in me. I'm also, so I'm actually queer. And so my current yeah. partner is male. And so I guess in those, those dynamics can still exist in queer relationships. Mm -hmm. um, they can. But I think they, in some ways, maybe I'm a little, I, I feel a little bit freer of that, of trying to figure out what that might mean for me. Yeah. But as far as just, I, I think regardless, there's still, this pressure to at least, you know, for me being in a degree program that it is like, I've, I've, I've done all of this education, I must turn this into something useful. And I, I, I put that on myself. And I'm still kind of at a stage of trying to figure out, you know, what career would look like for me, let alone just what family formation kind of will look like. But what I do want to be is I still want to be present to my family. I think a role that has always been clear in my own family is, you know, because growing up, my younger brother is disabled. I've always imagined my role as being, you know, a, a care provider at some point, you know, he will live a long life and he, we want him to outlive my parents and that he will, because he's so, my, he's so, he's cared for well, but I think I've only ever imagined my role in as being you know, a care provider myself, you know, as I get older. Yeah, not the and, one that's cared this, for. And this diagnosis like totally flew that or just totally changed how I think about my own role and being able to do that going forward. And I'm still navigating that. I'm still trying to figure out what that means for me. And 
and yeah, I'm still trying to understand how I can still be there for my family or mm -hmm. how that role might have might change yeah. given my circumstances. I mean, you are just at the beginning of of your journey. I think it's totally valid to, to say that you're in the, the in-between stage because, I mean, Doug and I have been in it a little bit longer, but it, it, it's not great. It, it does take a lot of time to cope and stuff with, with that, especially the, the way that uh, relationship dynamics change uh, yeah. over the course of, of, of having it. So don't don't worry about like not knowing quite yet because we we barely know we've been in it. So I, I I'm happy that you're you're so honest about your your experiences, especially as a as a queer person, um, yeah. especially someone that that's uh, navigating a, a situation that's even niche. You know, it's not, it, it's, it's it's really it's an important perspective. So I uh, thank you. Doug, do you have any, you know any what, thoughts I, I'm, on that? I'm on the right. I'm on the on the far end of the journey. You know. You, yeah. You, uh, Andrew and and Ireland, if you put your ages together, I'm still older than both of you. You, um, you know, I first of all, I was really lucky. I would not my, well actually, the word is blessed that you know the 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 I, my employer had awesome insurance. I was out of. I didn't go to work for five months and uh, never missed a paycheck and and it all worked out really well for me and so i didn't have to worry about money while i was there and and i was able to come back you know half a day and then we started adding time to that until i went back full time and initially i was going into work every day and then when the COVID hit we all came home and and we continued to work from home most of the time so that's great for me because you know andrew you touched on fatigue <laughs> you know and and uh, i i tire easily and I, I think if I had to do all of the things by myself, you know, I'd do my own laundry, I had to figure out my meds, I had to cook, I had to do all that, I couldn't do it. And so I can be, how do I say this? I can, I can be who I am because I have a good partner, I have a good wife, mm -hmm. takes such good care of me. And, you know, in spite of, you know, having issues, even if I get a little bit sick, to get a little bit of a fever, then my bowel and bladder control goes out the window. <laughs> you know, she takes care of me. And, and so she's really helpful that way. And, and I really appreciate that because I don't know that I could deal with that. So I am, I am able to do what I can do because of my, my care partner, because of Holly. And, yeah. um, and, and, and Andrew, perhaps you'll have somebody at that point when you need somebody at that point. It doesn't it doesn't sound to me like you, you quite need that. You have somebody with that amount of care, you're in pretty good shape. But, but you know, when that happens and when you get there, you'll you'll have somebody that will be able to take care of your needs. Pretty confident of that. Yeah, I'll just have to make sure to let them take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hard. No, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's hard because, you know, my wife's younger than I am, but not much. And she has probably more aches and pains than I do. And so, um, you know, I've, I've tried to cut back on the things that I ask her to do. So. Yeah, but Holly is a sweetheart, a she good is. woman. She yeah. is, yeah. You really, I think everyone that, that's in this kind of situation, when we, when we have to pick the people that we spend the rest of our lives with, you do have to find somebody that's like that. You have to find somebody that just loves so endlessly that that care comes almost easy to. So I, I appreciate Holly. She's been she's every time I talk to her, I just I, I'm always so happy, <laughs> happy yeah. to see her, happy to talk to her. And, and you know what? And, and, and I'm glad you said that because because she's such an important part of my story. She is right. Yeah, and, and you couldn't do it without her. Difference. That's right. Yeah. Do you think that there's any aspect of, of chronic illness that you worry will affect your relationship? Like, ha has how has it affected you over time? As as a as someone, people that are in relationships with other people, like whether that's your care partner, whether that's your friends, do you think that it's it's changed now that you're you're not adhering to that strong masculine never cries persona anymore? Now yeah. that you're vulnerable. Now that you're like, yeah, I, I, I think it changes. You know, we, we, we find different aspects of, of each other and who we are. You know, 
I, again, I don't know quite to say this, but you know, nothing works the way it used to. And, and so our life has changed as a result of that. And so, but that's good. It's, it gives opportunities to grow and to, to develop and, and to, to be who we are. So, you know, Ireland, you know, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. And, and um, I get one of the things that I, I really rely on is the, the belief that there will come a time when I can do the things that I can't do now. Um, I used to play the guitar, the piano, neither one of them very well, by the way, but, but well enough that I could sit down and I could enjoy doing that. And, you know, one of the things that keeps me going is, is my knowledge, my belief that there will come a day when this hand will work and this leg will work and not likely in this life, but, but in the next or another. So, and again, I, 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 I show that because that's an important part of who I am. And, I'm, you know, I know that keeps a lot of people going. I don't know if I didn't have that, how well I would be doing. Yeah. Andrew, any, any thoughts on how your relationships have changed now that you no longer are invulnerable the way that some masculine men have to yeah. be? I think I... Hmm. As someone, especially because you've been in the, the care relationship side of things, now you're being more in the needing to be cared for at times. I think I continue to, I've been fortunate enough that my treatment has worked well. And so I haven't relapsed. And I think sometimes I worry that many of my, you know, friends or family still sort of don't understand kind of like what the day-to-day -day looks like for me. And I often find myself trying to, over explain that I'm yeah. in this, you know, or having to defend. It's kind of like a position that I have to defend that I am still a chronically ill person because I've recovered so well. I think I do worry about what it means for like work relationships or, you know, being in a grad program, being able to communicate my own needs especially mm -hmm. when it's like a high production environment and those are the expectations. And so being able to, I worry that having this chronic illness, people view me differently. Maybe they might be more hesitant to put too much work on me because of that. And I might want that. I might want to work more or I might want to work yeah. less, or I might want a more flexible deadline, or I wish that I was getting more things done. But I do, I, I do worry, like I worry how that might affect people's perceptions of my worth, which is kind of at the core of it. And so, yeah, I think, you know, again, as I had said earlier, I, it sort of comes back to a word is just desirability. You know, we, we live in such yeah. a society where having a chronic illness is seen as a liability. We're costly, we're expensive. And, you know, I think I still sort of wrestle with those themes of like, am I a liability to my family now? If I get, you know, sick, you know, if I get sick, are my parents caring for two kids? And am I a liability for my older brother and my sister-in-law who would be next in line? And so, yeah, I think I do worry about that, but again, as <laughs> Doug could probably attest to this and yeah. my therapist works with me constantly on is you know <laughs> those are not like real present things right now you know like I, I I am I could worry and think up so many more scenarios now I've just become so much more creative after being hospitalized about what could happen to me for mm -hmm. better or for worse so anything can happen I guess yeah yeah do you feel, either of you feel that there's any misconceptions about this disorder in relation to men that you'd like to address? Any Anything that people think about men with this disorder that you, you're like, can someone just please clarify this? I'm tired of getting, I'm tired of hearing this question. <laughs> you know, not not so much. In fact, I think the, the um, um, thing that I worry about sometimes is that, well, there's two thoughts. One is, 
people don't like to be around sick people or disabled people. And I, let me explain that. So about the same time that I went back to work, one of the guys that I worked with had a bad skiing accident and shattered his leg. And after about six months or a year, he was back to normal. You know, he got, with the exception of some still, you know, that they had to put in his body. <clears throat> I was having a conversation with him and, and it was clear from the conversation that he had an expectation that at some point I would be back to normal. You know, that I would be walking fine and that I would be okay. And, and so, and, and people want that. People want you to be okay. And I get that. And that's, that's great. I'll never be that way again, right? I have to accept that and, and so do they. But what I've also found is that because I, I do walk and I, you know, when I go to church, I walk and, and, and use a cane, but people probably don't appreciate my degree of disability because they look at me and they're very positive about what they see. And so it's not, it's not so much a question that I get Ireland. It's the, maybe there's a disconnect between what people see and how I'm really feeling. And every once in a while, I wish I could take my finger and touch people <laughs> and so that they could feel how I'm feeling for just a second. The problem with that is, is I would probably get the re reciprocal, right? I would feel what you're feeling and I wouldn't like that either, <laughs> right? So <laughs> that's why we don't do that. But, but. Yeah, you know, I guess every once in a while, it, you, I talk, it can be a little bit lonely still because, because it's really difficult for others to appreciate how you're feeling. Yeah. And the whole expectation of, of you know, you're yeah. sick. Aren't you going to get better? It's, exactly. It's, it exactly. can be so frustrating. Well, like, I've written extensively about it. It's like people want me to package up my story and tie it up in a little red ribbon as though it's like, you know, finished and done with. But, yeah, exactly. you know. Chronic illness is is a journey. It's, it's, it likely won't end within our lifetimes. It's probably That's going right. to be like this. And right. I think we just make the most of it. We just do our yeah. best. Yeah. And it's it's okay if our narrative isn't pretty. It's it's uh, it's ours. It's our life. Yeah. It's 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 totally totally valid to feel that way. Andrew, do you have any like you know misconceptions or questions you're tired of hearing or? Anything about uh, this disorder or being a man with this disorder? Anything you'd like to say? I think, I think one thought that came to mind when I was really trying to think about how this could be different is I've been fortunate enough to build a really good relationship with my team of providers. And I think I've been fortunate enough that the folks that saw me inpatient continue to, for the most part, see me outpatient. And so they they have that they have that really important memory of what where I was and where I am in front of them, and they haven't forgotten that. But I think that, and this is just for myself, you know, learning. I was more reluctant to share my full symptoms with providers or to express my needs to other people, and I've really had to learn how to do that again. I've had to really learn how to see like feel when something feels off in my body and to be more aware of that i also think that and this has kind of come up doug and i haven't really like said it explicitly or maybe i did a little bit but i think we really when you have this disease being really mindful of anxiety stress and depression and that is such a a, a, a difficult thing that maybe we won't men may not seek out as easily on their own. I think everybody has a struggle with it, but in particular that, and I think that had folks, and I, I, I sort of had wished that when I was initially hospitalized, that someone had told me like, not just getting some support, but really getting some help managing anxiety and depression that are going to come with this. And to know that that's like really normal but also to really get the care that you need for that too, right? Like I was, I was up walking and running within like a few months and swimming back again. And then, you know, feeling down came later, right? Like my mind showed up later and that was a longer recovery for me to kind of navigate. And I still 
go through it. But I think just building up that kind of strength to you yeah. is something that I think is really important for men to be able to share openly that it's like, yeah, I am feeling depressed or I'm really anxious about what can happen. I'm really nervous about the, going and getting this blood work or yeah. getting this MRI. Or when I went back to the hospital, if I smell the soap, I, mm. it takes me, I just feel a certain way in my body and becoming more aware of that. So, and being able to share that with others too is a, a really important thing that I think men might struggle with a little bit more and providers should be aware of that. I think that's totally fair. I think especially mental health and men, there's a, there's a huge stigma on actually going to therapy and going to go see the, the psychiatrist and, and, or even receive mental health medication, like antidepressants, anti-anxieties. So definitely, I think that people should focus on that and do whatever they can to support their, support their mental well-being as well as their physical. Do you guys feel as, as though uh, there's anything healthcare providers uh, could be doing uh, to provide more gender sensitive care? Like, have, have there any, been any, ever been any moments where you were like, I, I really wish that they understood how to care for me as a man with this disorder? I, you know, I, I really haven't. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had awesome, much like Andrew said, I've got really great uh, health people, providers. I've got a good team, and and I, I they they allow me to participate in the decision making. And so, and, and, you know, Andrew talked about the anxiety of having some procedures. The, if, I don't know, Andrew, if you had plex or apheresis, but when they, the, the second time I had to have that, I was nervous because they come, cut your jugular, <laughs> put a tube in, and, and they were good enough to give me a little Xanax before that happened. And it was, it was, it was fine. And then I slept for 12 hours straight. But, but yeah, it's, it's about admitting uh, that I, I told him, I said, you know, the last time wasn't very much fun. I'm not looking forward to it this time. And they were able to approach that. But I've never felt any gender bias in any way or, you know, towards me and asking questions and answering questions. Good. Okay. My, I'm, my neurologist is a woman. You know, yeah. We have good conversations. So. That's good. Uh, Andrew, did, did you experience that? I think the one thing that was maybe more difficult for, not difficult, but I think was harder to sort of bring about um, was, and you see this often in like the men's forums is, you know, sexual health and sexual dysfunction mm -hmm. and how you navigate that or how do you ask or bring that up. And so I think, and that actually, I had to initiate that conversation with my providers and oftentimes they might, you know, I might feel more comfortable talking with my neurologist about that, but they might not be the right person to talk to. I might want to go talk to a urologist or anything with like bladder or incontinence, you know, right. and I may not need to go see a urologist regularly for, or have regular scheduled follow-ups because I don't have those issues as often. But I do think that sometimes with providers, like sexual health is like a huge part of that. And there's that interplay with anxiety and depression and <laughs> all of that sort of comes together. So I, th I do think that, and that's not, you know, just for men, I think that's for all, but I do think that men might, that in particular, men might be more or just really concerned about bringing that up to their providers as like a key component to like living a healthy life again. Mm -hmm. We're trying to work on that with a, a group of people. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, honestly, crazy. they send you they send you from doctor to doctor to doctor. I've gotten like so many referrals: urologist, physical therapist. Well, it's the, hard to find the right person. It is, and it's particularly for again, you know, sexual health. As, as Andrew was talking about, y you know, when you have a significant case of NMO, as I mentioned earlier, everything is affected, everything is impacted. To Andrew's point, I collect, I've said this before, I collect ologists, you know, so I have a urologist that I go to for those kinds of issues. I have a pulmonologist for my lungs. And, and, and part of this navigating this disease, I think, is finding the right person, the right ologist. 
to help you with the specific questions that you have and, and you build a team, you know, and I have an immunologist that I see regularly as well. So it's a, it's good when you go to the doctor and the doctor knows who you are. Yes. They remember you from the last visit and that's yeah. the kind of team that you need to build. I'm a big, just offhand mention, I'm a big proponent for physical therapy for um, sexual dysfunction. It's, it does help. I, I've tried doing uh, a couple different medications to help me, that sort of stuff, but it wasn't until I, I stumbled upon PT that our physical ther therapy that I actually had any kind of results. So anybody listening, <laughs> I would definitely recommend trying to get a referral to a physical therapist for any sort of sexual dysfunction or, or weakness of bladder control, all that. It, it did help, but it took a while, but it did help. I would say, okay, we're, we're, we're close to wrapping up. What advice would you give to men who have been recently diagnosed with this disorder? Uh, that well, could would, go, I would, yeah, I, would, I would go back to what Andrew said earlier. I think you, 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 you find out, you get connected with other men that have this disease. You know, and the, Kathy Jackson has a men's group. I'm not aware of any others that are specifically for that, but but I would get connected with that group, and and I would get connected with the SRNA groups as well. It, it, it's 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 not just a man thing, right? It, we 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 men and women get this disease, and there are things that I learn from men and women all of the time that help me navigate this. So get connected. Yeah. There's also peer-to-peer -peer connections too. So like if anybody needs to just be on one-on-one, -on -one, we also offer that at SRNA. If you want to look it up, you can look up peer-to-peer -peer -peer and they can yep. immediately just connect you with someone who has uh, your same disorder or a similar disorder. Be able to, to, to um, have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Although the support groups are, are kind of, are, they're, they're really taking off. I really think that it's a, it's a great option to receive support after diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, did you have any advice to men who have been recently diagnosed? I think patience is like really important. I think I said this a little bit earlier, but we often want to like move on as quickly as possible just to show our strength and resilience. And, or we dive deep into like learning. So learning about this condition just as, you know, as much as our doctors and part of that's just because we have to, to advocate for ourselves and in, in medical appointments. But I think that sometimes there's like this like pressure to master your condition or master your body be to take sort of autonomy back is to like master and know how this disease works, but also recognizing ways that no, there's like researchers still doing that. Like people are still trying to understand how this works okay. um, and to also leave room to just to to the unknown, to like being able to hold the unknown um, with a lot of you know curiosity and patience, and I think that it forces you then just to become more interdependent. So I would just like really recognize too that your body is something to that's really scary, <laughs> especially when you're right after like feeling diagnosed. It's really you're scared of it. You're afraid that it's going to hurt you. It's like, how could, why is this attacking myself? But I think what comes from that is really trying to figure out how to, yeah, reclaim some autonomy over yourself. That doesn't mean like becoming like the full on expert, but leaving room to hold some of that unknown um, a little bit better. Yeah. So that's what I would say. It's easier said than done. I would say spend, if I were to go back and tell myself, spend months wallowing. <laughs> like it's okay to wallow. And you, and that, that is like, that is part of this. And you don't need to wrap it up anytime after that. There's a lot to grieve and that's okay. That's that totally is. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else that either of you would like to have the chance to say before we wrap things up? I, I would say that the, the view looking forward is always better than looking backwards. You know, you can check your rear view mirror a little bit, but there's a reason it's a lot smaller than the windshield. 
right? It's because that's where our focus should be is what's what's ahead of us. Yeah. What about you, Andrew? I don't have too much more to share. Other, I I I, I totally agree with what Doug said. I think yeah. I spent a lot of time looking in the rearview mirror <laughs> <laughs> to try to make sense of it, and but now I more toward the future, even though yeah. still is unclear. You know, I I could still relapse but it won't look like what it did before because I'm, I'll know what's happening. Future is still bright. Yeah, I think so. In some aspects of our world. <laughs> Just takes time. Thank you to our ABCs of NMOSD sponsors, Amgen, Alexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease, and UCB. Amgen is focused on the discovery, development, and commercialization of medicines that address critical needs for people impacted by rare autoimmune and severe inflammatory diseases. They apply scientific expertise and courage to bring clinically meaningful therapies to patients. Amgen believes science and compassion must work together to transform lives. Alexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on serving patients with severe and rare disorders through the innovation, development, and commercialization of life-transforming therapeutic products. Their goal is to deliver medical breakthroughs where none currently exist, and they are committed to ensuring that patient perspective and community engagement are always at the forefront of their work. UCB innovates and delivers solutions that make real improvements for people living with severe diseases. They partner with and listen to patients, caregivers, and stakeholders across the healthcare system to identify promising innovations that create valuable health solutions.